um, we are going to finish up the book of Philippians. So turn with me to the book of Philippians chapter 4. The book of Philippians chapter 4, and it's going to be an abbreviated message tonight. We really want to encourage you to come next week. This is the last time I'll be on stage this semester. Um, next week, it's going to be all worship paradigm. And how many of y'all could use some help from heaven with your finals? Glory, glory, hallelujah. Lord, help me, Lord. All right, next week, come and seek divine assistance and lay your academic burdens down at the foot of the Lord. <laughs> We're all worship paradigm next week. Johnny and the worship team are going to do an abbreviated uh, paradigm. It's not going to be the full hour. Um, but we're going to come and just seek God together. And we're going to celebrate what he's done this semester and look forward with anticipation to what he's going to do in the future. So be sure and be here next week and bring somebody with you. They can encounter the presence of Jesus through the environment that our worship team creates. All right. Uh, if you're checking in tonight, how many of you have already checked in? Anybody already checked in? Some overachievers? Nobody? Oh, my goodness. You guys. Uh, if you check, all right. Awesome. So if you're going to check in, here's the uh, suggested status line, a couple of them tonight. Of course, as always, you could take a picture of the person beside you and check in with that photo. That's pretty sweet. You know, guns up. Or you can, here's the suggested status line for tonight, giving greater than getting. Or suggestion number two is he is able. He is able. Anybody curious about my shirt, by the way? I'm pretty proud of this shirt. Anybody know where this shirt comes from? I'm, or what kind of, what, where in Arkansas? Um, <laughs> okay. Yeah, hey, where's Kyle? Kyle? Kyle Johnson should know this, right? The, the bowl weevils, do you know? No? Yeah, yeah South. It's the, yeah, thank you. <laughs> Narrows it down to the state. The University of Arkansas at Monticello. The Fighting Bull Weevils. ESPN has this um, contest from time to time about the lamest mascots in the country, and these babies are in the running all the time, right? The Fighting Bull Weevils, the Ferocious Bull Weevils. So fear the weevil. <laughs> all right. Uh, that's where my dad graduated uh, from college. Two sisters graduated from there as well, not far from my hometown. So as we as we jump into this last message, we're, we've been marching through the book of Philippians, and the title of the message is Indestructible Joy. Indestructible Joy, unshakable joy. So regardless of what life throws at you, regardless of what circumstance you walk through, regardless of what storms slam your life, you're going to be okay. Why? Because of the joy of the Lord that is your strength. The joy of the Lord is indestructible. The Apostle Paul is writing this book from prison. So you'd think he'd be writing it from youth camp or from the Passion Conference or from some mountaintop monastery, but he's writing it from the front lines. He's dodging bullets and the foxholes, and he's saying the joy of the Lord, joy unspeakable. He just, it's the theme of the book is joy, and yet he's writing it from prison. So chapter 4, let's read the last part of this book together, beginning in Verse 14, yet it was good for you to share in my troubles. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out, set out from Macedonia, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving except you only. For even when I was in Thessalonica, Thessalonica you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that, what I desire is that more be credited to your account. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. In verse 19, I want you all to tune in here. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To God, to our God and Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Woo! And my God will meet what? Turn to the person beside you and say, all of your needs. All of your needs. Oftentimes, we, we over-spiritualize the Bible and say, well, Jesus is going to meet my spiritual needs, but the Bible is holistic in its application, where he's going to meet all of our needs 
according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. So that's the key verse there, because some of y'all are like, I got a need for a taco because it's Cinco de Mayo. <laughs> Lord, meet my need. Like the manna and the OT, it's raining tacos in West Texas. No, and that's not, <laughs> I got a need for a $50 bill. You know, it's not like a genie in a bottle. You rub the Bible and then you ask Jesus for what you want. No. Right? So my God will meet all of your needs according to the glory of his riches. Where? Okay, did anybody? Where? In Christ Jesus. That's the key part to all of this. Ephesians says we have received every, say every, every spiritual gift in the heavenly realms in Christ. So here it is. The gospel satisfies every need. That's a strong statement. Strong statement. Some of y'all are like, man, I got needs you don't know about. I don't have to know about your needs, okay? I mean, if you want to talk later, we can. I took a counseling class in seminary, so whatever. <laughs> your needs. I have needs. We all have needs, right? But the gospel satisfies every need. And so here's the deal. You can never justify stepping outside of the boundaries of God's word in pursuit of your needs. Uh-oh. You know what that means, right? I mean, do I have to, do I have to really get, okay. Ah, I'm 20 years old. I got physical needs. You can't blame a brother, right? I mean, I got the, you know, we're human. And so oftentimes in pursuit of our physical needs, we step outside of the boundaries of the Bible. And the Bible itself says that God will meet your every need. The gospel completely satisfies. The gospel is sufficient. It truly is. That's what the Apostle Paul says here. He talks in specifically here in Philippians about money. Money, money, money. Show me the money. <laughs> Jerry Maguire, anybody? No, okay. Here's the deal. We, we don't like talking about money in the church, makes you uncomfortable, but the Apostle Paul was pretty comfortable talking about it. The Philippians gave him a financial offering, right? And so what we're, the specific context here is of Paul having a, a financial need and the Philippians met that need. And he says you were able to worship through giving. He uses this Old Testament sacrificial language that their gift was an aroma pleasing to God. It was a sacrifice, an aroma pleasing to God. So in the entire Old Testament, they came to worship and they brought a sacrifice. And if it was given with the right motive, with the right heart, it wasn't just giving the sacrifice. It was giving it with the right heart, the right motive. Then it was pleasing to God and a sacrifice that was acceptable to God. And, he, and the, the Apostle Paul is carrying that forward into the New Testament saying, when you put your money in the offering plate, if it's done with the right motive, with the right heart, that can be an act of worship. That should be an act of worship. So worship through giving is part of this. In this verse 19, it's an amazing verse, like I already said, with lots of implications. The immediate context has to do with money. However, the principle of provision covers every area of life. God, the glories of his riches in Christ Jesus will meet your emotional needs. The glories of his riches in Christ Jesus will meet your financial needs. God is able, no matter the situation or the circumstance, he's able to meet every need. Ephesians 3.20. It's a great memory verse. Anybody memorize this verse? He is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine according to his power that is at work within us. So here's the deal. The amount of the money doesn't matter as much as the motive. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, check this out. Oh, that's Zephaniah. 2 Corinthians chapter 8, the amount doesn't matter as much as the motive. And we're about to wrap this up. It's about to get super practical here. And now, brothers and sisters, we want you to know about the grace that God has given the Macedonian churches, which that's where, guess what? What, do you, what, what church do you think was in Macedonia? 
We, we were just there. We've been there all semester. Philippians. Okay. All right. Okay. The Philippian church. He's referring to the Philippian church. In the midst of a severe trial, check this out, their overflowing joy and their extreme poverty welled up in rich generosity. Listen, I know some of y'all are thinking, bro, I'm searching for quarters underneath the couch cushion to buy ramen noodles. <laughs> and it's amazing how many ways you can prepare the ramen, <laughs> You know, I'm, I'm, like, I'm like elbow deep underneath the driver's seat, right, looking for gas money. Because, those, you know, those dimes and nickels, they fall down in between the seats sometimes. I've been there. But what, you can't, just, you can't use your broke college status as a way of justifying not giving, not worshiping through giving. Because he says here, he says it was, their, it was their joy that motivated their giving in spite of their extreme, say extreme, Extreme poverty. Now, I know it's rough, but would you say you're in the extreme poverty category? Some of y'all might be. And if you are, come talk to us. We will help you out, okay? For real. Our mission pastor, Jerry's here. We will hook you up with some food, with some gas money. Um, but most of us, let's on, you know, money's tight, but you're not in the extreme poverty category. And what he says here is that their joy in the gospel because of what God had given and done for them in Christ Jesus, which resulted in this unspeakable joy, that's what motivated, fueled their generous giving in spite of their extreme poverty. Let me give you uh, just a little snapshot of what this might, what this has looked like in my life is when I've gone on mission trips before. Been to Haiti four times, Right? And you go, you go to these places. You ever been to a place of extreme poverty? Extreme poverty, right? And you go there and they give you all they have, right? We were in a place of, I would say, extreme poverty over spring break. Wouldn't you agree, Jerry? Like it was the, the family we, that we had the privilege of building this house for. I mean, they were living in a, in a tent with a, little, with a little baby girl, and, you know, so we got an opportunity. God used us to provide that house for them. But th th this lady would, you know, she said in her speech at the end of the week, she said, I gave you what I had, and that was these breakfast burritos, right? And for her, that was a big deal. When I go to Haiti, I remember I was up in this Haitian village, this Haitian mountain village. Um, me and a former student of mine, a good friend of mine uh, from Arkansas, and we were, we were scouting out this potential mission spot in this Haitian mountain village. And we risk our lives getting to the top of this hill. Because if you've ever seen a Haitian vehicle before, I mean, you're risking your life just getting into the thing. I mean, we, we were on our way back from the airport one time, and the front tire fell off this bad boy. And that was one of the better ones. So we're going up this mountain, right? And it, it's, uh, it's treacherous. We get to the top, and, you know, it's not often that they see non-Haitian people, right? So it was like, oh, man, non-Haitians, what are you guys doing here? We're like, we're here to share Jesus with you. And then our Creole translator, you know, whatever, he, I don't know what he said, but the house that we stayed in, they killed this goat for us, right? And I mean, don't think, um, don't think lamb chops, right? Some of you are like, man, sweet. No, not. But they, it was a big deal. It was like the sacrificial lamb. Like it was like the, the, they killed the fattened calf in the Old Testament. It was a goat. It was a skinny goat. It wasn't a fattened goat. But it was a Haitian goat, and it was a prized possession. And they killed that bad boy, and they cooked it, and they brought it to us. And you could tell in their faces they were so excited to present their very best. Out of their extreme poverty, they were very generous. And I remember taking a, a bite of that, of that goat, and I, was, I was like, and I saw the hair on it, right? And honestly, I saw him prepare it, and that ruined it for me because it was, I mean, you couldn't see the meat for the flies type deal. Um, and because it, it is no refrigeration type, and it was out in the middle of this Haitian mountain. But I choked that goat meat down for the glory of the Lord. <laughs> Good. Of course, when you do that, it backfires because, like, you want more. <laughs> okay. Oh, God, help me, Lord. <laughs> Raw goat meat with goat hair and, like, mixed into it. It's <clears throat> interesting. So here's the deal. Let me wrap this up. You need to be giving, right? Out of your overflowing joy, you need to be giving even out of poverty, even when you don't have much. 
giving results in God's glory and our good. Check this out. Christian Smith wrote a book called The Paradox of Generosity. And get this, they studied people that give across America, a widespread study. It wasn't a religiously affiliated study. And it was a, it was a shocking find. It was that the more generous a person is, the more happy, healthy, and purposeful they are. So when God said, I will meet all of your needs according to um, the glory in Christ Jesus, here's how that happens, right? Because he's designed us in, certain, in a certain way that when we're obedient to the word of God, when we give, right, it's mutually beneficial. Now, that's not the incentive and the motive. I want to be happy, so I'm giving you something. But when we give with the proper motive, with the right heart, we become happier people. And that was documented in this study. They define generous as people that give at least 10% of their income, and only 2.7% of people in America give that much. He says there's a direct correlation between generosity and overall health, emotional and physical. Generous people are less prone to anxiety and depression. And check this out. Generous people, they calculated, were 30% less likely to die. Let's pray. No, I'm playing. Let's <laughs> Drop the mic. Give or die. <laughs> but in the time that they studied this, generous people were 30% less likely to die. So the effects of generosity, and get this, this is a, an important part of this study, was it wasn't just a one-time gift. The preacher's talking about money, twisting my arm, guilt tripping me into giving some money to the church. No, I'm talking about consistent giving, not one-time giving. This is consistent giving, weekly giving, right? So I want you to do this. I want you to think about how you're worshiping the Lord through financial giving. And I've already taken your, taken your excuse away, right, in 2 Corinthians 8. They, were, they had this extreme joy, and that motivated this generosity that it was in spite of their poverty, right? So they did it, and Paul was like, look at those guys. Look at the Philippians. You guys need to be like them, right? And so I'm saying as college students, I know, right, you're, you're ordering from the value menu, right? Sometimes you splurge and you upsize, but I, I know how it is. I've been there, right? And so I know how it can be when money's tight and you're like, I don't have money to give. But the, the Bible says it and the research confirms it that people that are consistently generous are happier people. You ever met somebody that's a tightwad, right? They're just walking around like this. <laughs> they got like rolls of quarters in their fist. And if you ask for it, you know, you're going to get punched in the face with it. Like, they're just like, hmm, like the Grinch. You know, the Grinch, and he's so greedy, and his heart is shrunk up and all shriveled and shriveled. <laughs> yeah, those people, uh, people that have money, but they're not happy, right? And I've been to Haiti four times. They got nothing. There's kids out playing with sticks in Walmart bags, and they're living in a, in a Samaritan's purse hut. And they look at them and they're just so joyful and happy and they got nothing, right? And then they'll give you whatever they have. They don't have anything, but they got, they got a sack of rice and they'll cook it all for their guests. And they're, and they're happy to do it. And yet over here, we, we really have so much. And yet many of us, we give so little. So here's the challenge. The challenge is this Sunday, let that be the first Sunday of you sacrificially giving to whatever church you go to. Whatever church you go to, you start consistently giving. Because here's the deal. One of these days, believe it or not, you guys are going to graduate. Now, that's good news, isn't it? Some of y'all are like, I don't know. The jury's still out. I got that one class. It's going to be close, brother. <laughs> Pray for me. You know, I'll bring the holy water next week. And Listen, if you struggle now with giving $10, you will struggle later when you're making a lot more. I know it doesn't make sense up here right now. And you're like, man, one of these days I'm going to graduate and I'm going to be an engineer and I'm going to be making the bank. But right? that's the light at the end of the tunnel. Right? I'm going to pull these all-nighters because it's going to be a payday someday. Right? And so I'm going to study my tail off. I'm going to not party. I'm going to go to the library instead of the party. And someday I'm going to make a salary. And listen, someday you're going to be in a position where you'll be able 
to help ministry like the Philippians helped the Apostle Paul. Like the Philippians. And so there's going to be people that feel called to go. People that feel called to go and say, I, I feel called to go to this country. I feel called to go to this ministry. And then it's going to be your calling to send them. When you're making the money, I'm telling you, if you're not giving now, it's going to be hard to give then. Right? So I want you to do this. I want you to start with this. This is, this is kind of you know, 10% is a, good, is a good number to work with. But I want you to start putting $10 in the plate every Sunday. All right? Now, that's not asking too much. That's $40 a month. $40 a month. You know, and this is consistent giving. And then watch over time as that affects your life. All right, come on. I buy a skinny vanilla latte for five bucks. It used to be a venti caramel macchiato. But, you know, I just had to make some changes to my lifestyle. <laughs> now it's a skinny vanilla latte for five bucks. So I'm saying, hey, you know, don't go through the drive through at Cane's and get the $10 Caniac, right? Don't, I mean, just sacrifice one meal or one, uh, one trip to the coffee shop, $10 a week. And I'm not going to ask you, there's no way to check up on this. I'm going to be watching you right now. <laughs> No, I'm not going to, there's no way to check up on this. $10 a week, every week, $40 a month, right? And, it, and re, honestly, I mean, you know, it's not like the, the pastor is going to come to you or you're going to get like a handwritten note from the staff. Thank you for your generous gift. We've been allowed to do so much more ministry now in the third world. Uh, no, your $10 is not so much for what it does for the church, but guess what? What it's going to do for you. That's what the Apostle Paul said. It's not that I... You know, it's not so much that I got the money and I benefited from it. He said that it's going to be credited to your account in the eyes of God. And at the end of it, you'll be happier and you'll be healthier. So do that, $10 a week, every week, and then go from there. And then someday when you graduate, some glorious day when you graduate and you get that job, and you're making $50,000 a year. Now, all of a sudden, it can get really fun. You know, of course, you pay your student loans, right? For the next 60 years, you pay your student loans. <laughs> Just go ahead. I'm still paying my student loans, okay? Just get ready for it, all right? My kids are going to inherit my student loan debt, okay? <laughs> but here's the deal. Then, you, then the $10 can become more. All right, you give your tithe to the church, your faith family, and you give offerings above and beyond that. And that's when it gets fun, All right? That's when you start can dropping money, meeting needs. You know, God, where, I got this extra. What do you want me to do with the Lord? And then it gets fun, right? Because you can give stuff anonymously. That's when it gets really fun. When you drive by somebody's mailbox that you know is in need and you just drop a card with money in it with no name and they just give glory to God. And you, you get the blessing of knowing that God used you to answer somebody else's prayers. So, start giving now. Giving is greater than getting in the kingdom of God. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for your word, the book of Philippians. How it challenges us, encourages us, and I just thank you, God, for what you've done this semester and what you're doing even tonight. Help us to take this challenge seriously. Lord, that uh, you're, you're Lord over all of our life, not just our souls, but everything, including our bank accounts and our wallets. Help us to take this challenge seriously, that this Sunday, as a part of worship, we'll put some money in the plate, and next Sunday, as a part of worship, and the Sunday after that, and years from now, we'll still be doing that for your glory and for our good. Amen. Thanks again for tuning in. We hope you enjoyed this week's Time in the Word and look forward to seeing you next time. Check us out online at www.930.org and have a great day.